We come before him with a reverence and a sincerity and a fear, an awe. Paul said it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands or the, into the hands of a living God. Acts chapter 5, verse 11. I've often wondered if, if, this, if, if God did this today, how many, would, how many of our people in, in, in our churches in America today would show up the next week? This is, this is a, a New Testament story. This is not an Old Testament deal. And this happened in a local New Testament church after the church just took off and was growing by leaps and bounds. Acts chapter 5. They were taking an offering. Why is it that when you take offerings in church that it becomes a big deal and it's such a big problem with money? And why people get all bent out of shape and why it seems like money becomes an issue. It became an issue with Ananias and Sapphira because they wanted to get attention for what they were giving. They saw Barnabas. He'd given everything. And so verse 1 says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price. Was that their right? Yes or no? Sure. His wife also being privy to it. So both, they both agreed. Both had discussed it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart that thou hast, not, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? What had happened is they kept that part of the price, but they gave the impression that they'd given everything, like Barnabas. Well, when Peter speaks to Ananias, and he says, you've not lied to men, but you've lied to the Holy Ghost, God struck him dead right there on the spot. Three hours later, his wife comes in, and he asks her the same question. Did you sell the property for this price? Yes. You've not lied to men, but you've lied to God, and God struck her dead. Now, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but it was a huge deal in the New Testament church because the Bible says when they were growing, they were in one accord. There was a unity. They had the whole, their mindset, everything. It wasn't about them. It was about God. It wasn't about, look at me. It was about, look at Him and what He's done in our lives. It was a different mentality. And they got in the way of God. And God removed them out of the way. Now look at, Ma look at Acts chapter 5. And verse 11, and great fear came upon all the church, all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. So not only was the fear of God upon the entire New Testament church, but it spilled outside the doors of the church because they feared God, and so that affected the, the sinners outside the church. And that's the difference in what we're seeing today out there. Because we've lost the impact and we've lost the fear in here. Turn to 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter. I think this will help us with this particular thought. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look in verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now look at this verse. And if the righteous 
scarcely be saved. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Folks, if we don't get back to old time, old fashioned holiness, reverence, respect for God, and living righteous lives, we can kiss goodbye the opportunities we have to reach those that are lost out there. Because they won't want our gospel because they already know what they are. And they don't see a change in the average Christian today. And so it's important that we have our lives right with God. That we have that fear factor in our heart. We haven't lost the fear of God. Turn, if you will, to the book of Acts, chapter 10. The book of Acts in chapter 10 and verse 35. Acts 10 and verse number 35. Peter has gone to see a man named Cornelius. He was an Italian man and he was praying one morning and God says, I want you to go to Joppa. There's a man praying upon a roof. He's staying with Simon a Tanner. And while Peter was having a vision and God was telling Peter not to call common what he had cleansed, Cornelius was knocking at the door. Peter comes down. He asked what they wanted. And he said, God sent me to you. And he told me he wanted you to speak to me. Peter got the permission of God to go. He gets to the house and his entire family and, and others there, probably servants, were there. And he preaches unto him Jesus. And Cornelius was gloriously saved. And those in the house were saved. The Bible says, though, of Cornelius, that he was a man that feared God. Verse 35 says, But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word, of God, word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. This is the message that Peter gave to Cornelius. And he feared God and trusted Christ. As the Son of God. Paul comes to Antioch in chapter 13 and verse 16. And we, we have no more time. We'll close with this. In verse 16, it says, Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that, what? Fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm he brought, brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in, their, in their, the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their lot. And he goes on and he gives this wonderful message. But his message starts with men of Israel. He says, fear God. Men of Israel who fear God. Why the fear factor? Why have we lost it? Perhaps it's because in this 21st century, what we have done is we have taken the concept of fearing the Lord and we've minimized it. We've lost our sense of reverence and awe in our relationship with our sovereign Lord. We don't truly see him for who he really is. And until we as God's people recognize the majesty and the power of our holy God, we will never be what we ought to be. And nor will we ever have an effect upon the sinner like we need to have. So I challenge you tonight to ask God for godly fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it's not talking about the wisdom of man. It's talking about the wisdom of God. Doug's gonna, he's chosen a song of invitation. Let's stand and as we, as we sing.